Thank you, Nick, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. It's great to see uh, so many of you interested in this exciting technology, which we're all trying to uh, um, explore in terms of how it can help us and, and what we're trying to do for our patients. So I'm going to spend a few minutes talking to you a little bit about the system. And uh, this is something you can certainly see um, out in the exhibit hall, but I, I want to just talk you through a little bit about what are the basic components are. They consist of a workstation, um, a remote catheter manipulator that, uh, and a remote wire manipulator that I'll show you in closer uh, detail, a setup joint, and then a bedside controller either also. So you can actually work this at the tabletop um, or go to a remote uh, workstation um, that you'll see. <clears throat> So on the uh, angiographic or OR table, you can see the way um, the setup joint is, is uh, its place. There's a number of cables and connectors that, uh, that go to an electronic module that handles all the data information moving back and forth. And then a wire manipulator and catheter manipulator that are part of that elbow joint. Uh, and you can see the highlighted bedside controller. Um, which is used in addition to uh, this physician workstation, and I'll show you uh, perhaps one image of, of a remote location, but uh, generally speaking, um, with a combination of this remote controller, which allows you to control all the aspects of the catheter, and another remote controller for the x-ray, uh, which frequently comes on a pedestal, you can actually control um, everything you need, both the imaging, the table movement, everything from one position um, at this remote station. <clears throat> um, the, uh, the, the, the robotic catheter is designed to facilitate intravascular na uh, navigation and delivery of therapeutic devices. I'm going to show you some of both of those applications, and you'll see a lot more of them through the exciting presentations of the rest of the panelists. Uh, the components include a, a, a inner leader or, or, and a steerable outer sheath that comes in three different lengths at this point in time. Both the leader and the sheath are equipped with proximal hubs, which enable them to be attached to the robotic system for insertion. So there's a, a triaxial situation with a wire, a leader, and a sheath, um, all of which are controlled uh, by the robotic uh, uh, system. The leader itself is a six French OD device and three French inner diameter. This is uh, how you would, one of the vehicles by which you could deliver therapy if you were delivering coils or other types of things. It's compatible with wires up to 018 and 035, so you can use either of these types of wires to steer where you want to go. Um, the catheter is directed with four pull wires articulating at the distal end, and I think all of you are aware that this device is not just simply a deflector device that goes right, left, north, south, but you can actually move in three-dimensional space uh, with a great degree of control. Um, that resides inside of a nine French outer diameter and six French inner diameter uh, uh, sheath. Uh, that has full f four pole wires also at the distal end, which you can see in cross-section on the lower right. The sheath fits around the leader and can be used with or without the leader uh, to move forward and be directed. And that's available in three different lengths. And here you can see those uh, laid out here, and they're in a coaxial way. So if you start thinking about the kind of movements you have, it's not just upwards and backwards with the wire and the sheath and the catheter, but you can move each of these independently in various directions in, in a fairly simple fashion. Um, the catheter itself uh, at the leader section, which is what we would traditionally call a catheter, um, has a very soft distal tip. Um, you can see it's uh, um, got a very radiopaque uh, uh, portion that's able to be seen and, and can, in fact, uh, reach 100, 180 degrees of, uh, of curvature uh, in addition to its rotational characteristics. And the sheath itself um, has a lot of steerability and directional control as well. And this comes uh, when you, if you have a chance to try this or, or, or use it at the, uh, at the booth, you'll see that it's a, it's a different skill set and a different way of getting from point A to point B than you would in, in sort of the basics of angiography. Just very quickly, what got my attention in this, uh, in this whole space was something that actually came from the animal data. Uh, and this is the only data I'm going to show. And um, here in the United States, the, F the FDA required actually chronic animal data. So instead of just sort of putting it into an animal and make sure you didn't damage or dissect the arteries, the FDA required 30-day animal data. I think to everyone's surprise, um, you can see that um, these bar graphs uh, demonstrate the extent of uh, arterial injury that's demonstrated uh, histopathologically and what was observed and you can see the uh, the different types of access which arteries were seen and virtually across the board 
uh, the use of the robotic catheter was associated with histologically proven uh, decrease in, in trauma. And so this became a little bit of an aha moment to me and saying, okay, well, maybe something's really going on here that could offer us uh, a, a new way of doing things. This is uh, basically, I just want to show briefly what this looks like. This is a carotid case we're doing just to the table side. You can see the robotic catheter uh, and the robotic system connected to the femoral catheter. This TAM right here ordinarily now would be right to my left or right so I can control the, the actual rotation of the, uh, the room. The nurse is obviously still circulating, taking care of the patient. You can hear, see here some of the images uh, we're looking at as we navigate our way um, into the carotid circulation. That's kind of what the room setup looks like. And our, our particular environment is not an operating room. Many of you would be looking at operating room environments uh, and so on. So um, um, here are some of the potential procedural pros that you can see here, less traumatic cannulation, potential for reduction in contrast, and procedure times. And uh, really, I think long term, the future integration with fused imaging and 3D navigation will allow us to perhaps navigate um, with, uh, with less fluoro and, and no contrast. Uh, very quickly, I'm just going to just give you a couple of, uh, of uh, uh, snapshots of some of the things we've done because you're going to hear a lot more of that. We're, we're at about 40 plus cases now that we've had, and it's been interesting. I think we started out thinking, well, maybe it's going to be an EVAR device of some sort, but we've actually um, touched every aspect of the vascular interventional environment uh, for us. Um, uh, here's just an example of, of what can be done from a catheterization point of view. Um, you can see it's a type 1 arch, but there's a replaced um, uh, left common hepatic artery. So just think to yourself, okay, you're coming from the femoral artery. How would you go about trying to get into this left common uh, carotid artery? And what catheters would you use? And how many wires and what you would have to do to ultimately get a sheath up to this point to, or even a catheter uh, to do a diagnostic procedure? Um, and in this particular case, um, we were able to obviously navigate and ultimately put um, six French uh, sheaths, the, the treatment dime, here you can see the wires, uh, the leader and the catheter. Um, and you can see this particular patient was being evaluated for instant restenosis from a, from a previous carotid device. And uh, you can see here the device in place where the diagnostic angiogram is being done. And here you can see how we're steering our way and advancing the wire and catheter up the left side. So look at the configuration of this catheter compared to what you would expect if you were driving a Simmons 1 or a SOS 1. It's a very different type of thing and, and is, is quite a bit more direct and more facile in many ways. Um, here you can see how it looks. Um, here's this, uh, this catheter right here. So with the same wire, the same catheter, the same sheath, we got into both carotid arteries, treated one side um, with no change of catheters and so on, uh, despite the, um, the, uh, uh, the anatomic challenge. This is a more mundane application, but we've tried to, we're trying to assess where the use of robotics and the workflow of EVAR might have a role. And so in our own institution, what we do is we place the robotic catheter initially. This catheter is used for instead of a pigtail catheter, so we don't start with a pigtail or do an angio. We direct it towards the lowest renal artery. It doesn't have to be in the ostium. Generally, it's off in the middle here. And we just point it at the renal artery. And with two or three cc hand injections, we can continually identify the renal artery uh, during the course of EVAR, use it for positioning. Um, as you can see here, very small injections. Uh, reduction of contrast, obviously, uh, as a result, and then we go ahead and, and uh, uh, continue the procedure. Then once the uh, proximal end is deployed, then we pull the wire and catheter down, and the same device is used to uh, engage uh, the gate. And here you can see this happened to be an empty sac. Um, you can see we're able to create reverse curves, any type of shape you want, ultimately to be able to catheterize a gate, uh, and then um, drive the entire device up. And then once it's up, instead of putting a pigtail in, we can actually spin the robotic catheter. Remember I showed you uh, in, uh, uh, early on that this can go to 180, so we do the twirling, confirm we're actually in the body of the graft, and then, and then move on. So I think uh, I'll just show you very quickly. This is a carotid stent that was done from the left side. Again, um, here you can see driving the, uh, the catheter. This is the sheath, this is the catheter, this is the wire up in position. Um, and uh, you can see the level of opacity and control. So I think with that, I think I'll, I'll probably stop.
and uh, uh, let our other speakers go. So I, I think what, where we are right now is we're, we've, we've done about uh, over 40 cases. We have a, an experience that is diverse as what you've seen here, those two examples, but they also include aneurysm cases, visceral aneurysms, which you'll see some today, embolization procedures, uh, some recanalizations of occlusions, uh, deployment of things like amplatzers as w through the main sheath as well as coils through the leader catheter. And we're continuing to explore uh, the potential benefits of this technology. Thank you very much. Thank you, Barry. That's really, uh, <coughs> really exciting. I know you, you've got to leave, but you might just take one or two questions. Absolutely. If anybody has any questions about the device or anything I said, uh, I'd be happy to. Can you just, I know you have done yeah. some right carotids. Can you yes. just say how you find the pathway there? So, so um, right carotids are very easy uh, w with this. I mean, the, uh, you know, if you, again, <clears throat> One of the things that we're learning is the ability to work in 3D space. You know, we're, we're, all, we're all working in 3D all the time, but looking at 2D. Um, the difference is the degree of control we have over a catheter. Um, uh, so uh, the right carotid artery is generally done where you can create almost like an upward curve, something you take the leader, you create an upward curve, either like a, um, uh, pick the neurocatheter that you like of choice. You can come all the way almost to a Simmons curve, but not quite. But if you have a catheter directed up, uh, you try and identify where it is. Instead of dragging a catheter along the, the arch, which is what uh, Nick's probably going to share with you, where, where we use a catheter and drag it till it pops into an osteum, here we identify the osteum and you just drive the device right through it. Um, uh, and, and go where you want. You, you have to have a little knowledge about the anatomy, either from a CTA or something like that. We've actually done a couple of carotids where I haven't done any angiography and, I, and no CTA, which is the way we always used to do. Uh, you know, when, in the old days, we didn't know anything about the patient's anatomy. We just had to do bilateral carotids and verts, and, and we figured it out. And, and you can use it in the same way. One very brief comment I might make about the tactile, uh, the issue of tactile sensation. and. People say, well, you know, with a device like this, you give up a tactile uh, sensation. And obviously it's true, you don't really feel anything with a catheter, but what we've come to sense is that probably, I would say 50% of what we interpret as tactile sensation is probably visual. It's actually not tactile. You see a wire reacting against the wall. You see something uh, acting the way it's moving. And, and, and part of that is translates, it feels almost like you're feeling it when you're sitting at, at the console. So that's number one. Number two is that what, how do you get tactile sensation? You get it by dragging catheters along the wall of an artery or bumping into the back wall or things like that. And this is uh, very much a potential procedure where you're not actually touching anything. You're just um, uh, going you know, more essential through the lumen uh, to, to direct where you're going. You don't rely on backing off a wall or feeling a wall or popping into an osteum, that sort of thing. Which is the reason why, as you say, that very important data on histological examination is Very so important, yeah. yeah. Barry, I do have one question for you. Um, so I think one of your carotid cases shows it very well. Sort of that need to bury your wire. We always worry about mm -hmm. uh, injuring the organ we're going into. Right. And you know, when, when you do a carotid normally, you bury your wire in the external and then get your sheath up and so on. Right. Uh, the need for a wire to be so far out for kidneys, we worry about that as well. It's a, yeah, that, that's a very good point. And I actually hadn't thought about it until just now, but you're exactly right. We've never, in doing any of the carotids, put a wire out far. It's always been in the common. It, the device has so much stability, and you'll hear that from the other speakers. Um, it's a very different thing. The, the, the normal anatomy that wants to drive our shaped catheters and braided catheters in one direction or another doesn't exist. The device itself provides its own stability. Um, and so, yeah, we just get a wire up into the common, and the, everything just tracks up to it, exactly. 